and yes, yeah, and it, it will, it will. Ah, okay. It so, looks promising. Yes, okay. we are back. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> we are back. Oh, we we lost a couple of uh, attendees. <laughs> yes, we did. We did. Uh, unfortunately. Probably they will. I recommend it to um, uh, Sven to say in the chat of the other session to reload this, to reload to everyone. Yeah. Because when you have done it, you cannot talk any, anymore to everyone, but the people who are still there. Yeah. Mm. So I, I reloaded, so. Yeah, I think that's the. Uh, I should be good to go. But, so, so I'm the next one in line, I guess. I, Yes, you are. Yeah. Well, Elnas. Well, Elnas is here now. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I'm here. So let's see. I will just save the the chat because I think the chat will be. Um, so yeah. Welcome back. We are. Um, apologies for this break. We have no idea what the DLLs, what the, the technology did there. I see that you are coming back into room. Thank you very much for this. Um, and uh, hi again. Yeah, Frank, save, uh, Sergio, welcome back. Just, uh, well, if you cannot hear me speak, I, it doesn't matter if I say you reload your computer, your, your page, of course. But uh, obviously, several have um, tried to do that. So, um, Thierry, yes, I will invite you in. Thierry, you are uh, given permission to speak. Uh, <laughs> so we have room for you, Thierry. Sorry, we are just doing a little um, um, practical rearrangements here. Just hold on. It will be, I think we will be up and running full speed very soon. Uh, let me see now. Uh, yes, Thierry and Sergio. I think Sergio Albani, you can also ask for the floor. Uh, raise your hand. Hi again from Julian. Uh, yeah, Sergio, I, it looks like you're here. So uh, raise your hand so I can invite you in. Um, and the same with Thierry, Thierry joined the room, and then I also include um, Sergio. Okay, so I think we are ready to start, not losing too much time. So, Elna, now we are going to the other flagship. We are going to talk about biodiversity. So, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I think SFL will be started first. <laughs> he wants yeah. to? Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So, cool. Yeah, I hope everything will work will work well because Murphy's law is uh, not with me, I guess, uh, or is, is with me. I have to say. So, my name is Stefan Hennekes. I work as a vegetation scientist and a software developer at Wageningen Environmental Research uh, in the Netherlands. And i um, going to share my screen now, which is quite challenging. So uh, let me see, share. And now I should be able to run my, okay. Can you see my PowerPoint? We can, and you can hide that little um, rectangle at the bottom. Oh, yeah. Hide. Not, not stop. Yeah, yeah, hide. Yeah, yeah, hide. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank cool. you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, the aim of the uh, next uh, GEOS pilot application I'm going to uh, show is to, to model the spatial distribution of European habitats in an interactive way uh, using cloud services through the a community web client. The app uses in-situ vegetation plot data as observations and environmental data layers, as well as remote sensed EBVs, uh, essential biodiversity variables as um, predictors. Some background information. The input for the modeling uh, are about 1.5 million vegetation plot observations, which are derived from the European Vegetation Archive, the EVA database. And this database covers about 150 uh, UNIS habitat types. Uh, 
Uh, UNIS stands for European Nature Information System. Uh, the system basically comprises all European habitats, even non-vegetated habitats like caves or uh, other artificial uh, or constructed industrial or other uh, artificial habitats. Um, yeah, the model can be executed using a selection of a maximum of 30 predictors. Uh, um, and for the modeling itself, uh, we use the open source software MaxEnt. And the modeling process is, of course, running in the cloud and is controlled by a web client. Now, what is a plot observation that we consider as an in situ uh, entity? It is the recording of the co occurrence of species at a certain time and uh, are at a certain spot. Each plot can, based on its first composition, be assigned to a UNIS habitat type. Eh? As mentioned in the previous slide, um, in EVA database, we have about those 1.5 million of these plots. Um, yeah, and in total, uh, all these 1.5 million plots comprise more than 40 million species observations. So, so this database is a, is a very good source for uh, in situ observations. Uh, here we see an overview of the, uh, of the database, of the available data in the database. As you can see, uh, Europe is, uh, apart from the eastern part and Scandinavia, uh, pretty well covered. Now, as predictors for the modeling, uh, we have several uh, GIS layers with a resolution of one by one kilometer. It's not very, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit coarse, but on, on that level, it's, it's, it's sufficient, I would say, in European level. And these predictors include uh, climate predictors derived from the world climate data, topography layers like distance to water and elevation. And we have several uh, soil layers derived from uh, the, sorry, from the soil grid. Uh, soilgrid.org uh, and the number of uh, RS enabled EBVs mainly are derived from Sentinel data. And finally, we have uh, the population density, which is a meaningful uh, predictor when dealing with habitats that are largely determined by uh, human impact. Now let's focus on the application itself. Uh, this is what you see when you launch the application on the right side here. Uh, we have some general information on the on the pilot, and on the left we have two sections. The top section holds the UNIS habitat types, and the lower section holds the model predictors. In order to run a model, we have to make two choices. First, we have to select a habitat type. Sorry, a habitat type. You can see the habitat types listed here. Um, the UNIS habitat classification is a hierarchical system of which we only use the three highest levels. Um, at the highest level, the first level, we have a woodland and forest habitats. And on the second level, we have broadleaf deciduous woodland. And on the third level, we have, for example, here, the Fagus woodland on non-asset soils. Fagus is, uh, is uh, another word, is a scientific name for the beach, beach forest. So we're talking about. Um, oh, now, once the habitat type is selected, a uh, description appears on the right side, as you can see here, the description of this uh, beach forest. And um, at the same time, uh, the lower section is uh, unfolded and reveals the predictors. Eh? Now, any predictor can be selected or deselected by checking or unchecking uh, the boxes here on the on the left here on the left. So before we start the modeling, we can uh, first take a look at the available observation data. As you can see, for this habitat type, we have quite a bit of data. Um, and to avoid oversampling, a maximum of 5,000 of randomly selected plots are used to feed the model. So that's that's what's happening in, in the background, because we have much more data, for example, for this uh, for this habitat type. Now, by hitting the, the run model uh, button here down, uh, we can start the modeling process, uh, process, which normally takes about two minutes. OK. So when a model modeling process has finished, the results uh, can be looked at. First of all, we can see the contribution 
of each of the predictors uh, of the modeling. And secondly, we can select a prediction map in the top menu and then, for example, choose fraction, uh, fraction here or threshold. Okay. The fraction map, uh, which is now shown, is in fact the habitat suitability map in which the likeliness values in the grid cells varies from zero to one. The higher the value, the more intense the color and thus the more suitable a grid cell is with respect to the selected habitat type. You can see the map here in more detail and you can see that uh, the beech forest isn't likely to present in the, in the higher parts of the, of the Alps, as you can see here. And this is a threshold map uh, in which the values above a certain value are set to one and all values below that value is set to zero. Another piece of information are the graphs uh, showing, sorry, showing how each environmental variable affects the, uh, the max and uh, prediction. Yeah. And uh, the results can be downloaded here by clicking the result button. And as you can see on the right side, there's also the feedback button. So there's also the feedback me mechanism that was uh, uh, created for next use is also integrated in this application. Um, here is the link to uh, the application here on top and a schema showing the steps to get to the habitat suitability maps. And note that the schema also shows another possible step here and here uh, that uses the suitability map as a starting point uh, by applying high resolution Copernicus land cover data in another modeling process step, a more detailed map can be produced of a habitat type. We call that map a probability map, which has a much higher resolution than the suitability map. So we go from observed data to suitability map to a probability map. A bit confusing, but. So I would like to finish my presentation with a few prospects. Um, what we would like to do is to incorporate new RSEBVs, for example, hyperspectral uh, fraction cover. We would like to, uh, to be able to model at a finer spatial resolution, for example, 20 by 20 meters but then with on a, on a smaller area, of course. And also applying time series to identify potential, uh, potential uh, changes, for example, with a five years time interval. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stefan, for this. Uh, we will hurry on to, uh, to the next. Uh, I have to speaker. unshare my screen. Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. How, how do I find There. It? Yes, you're right. Ah, okay. You're right. Spot on. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Stefan. You're welcome. Uh, excellent uh, work. Uh, we are very proud of that as colleagues of, in next years. And you were talking about the essential biodiversity variables. And uh, I believe that Elmas will continue on that now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And yes. um, just an, so we, while you, you, yeah, I will give you the floor, Elnaz. Just just and, one remark, uh, just yeah. one remark that it's worthwhile to mention that the the data that was uh, uh, that is created by the ITC tool that you will see now is uh, is used in our in our product. So exactly. So they are yeah. linking this to yeah. uh, um, portals. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And and then I will while yeah I'll give you the floor, Elnaz. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Zneidawas, a researcher at ITC University of Toronto. My background is environmental science and biodiversity, and my main expertise is remote sensing uh, over thermal infrared domain. So I'm just uh, explain what we have done in next year biodiversity pilots briefly. Uh, yeah. Briefly will be nice because we are uh, we are very conscious that we are over time. Um, but let's try to aim for 12.30 so that we go through the entire program. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I start, uh, as uh, Benta said, uh, with essential biodiversity variable. We are very keen about this uh, sort of variable and explain 
And um, you heard um, about uh, this sort of uh, essential parameters uh, from dif uh, different uh, group of geos. Um, essential biodiversity variables tries to monitor biodiversity in a better way. And in this respect, we try to uh, make, a, uh, make a link between these uh, parameters and remote sensing data uh, that we call the uh, remote sensing enable ABVs. Um, among these parameters that proposed uh, by uh, biodiversity and remote sensing community, we took Lifuria and Dex as one of the most important biophysical uh, parameters proposed by um, even uh, essential climate variable and also as uh, remote sensing enable EBVs. Uh, in this respect, we uh, dig a little bit and we, as most of the remote sensing experts know that Leafery and Dex products is available out there um, through MODIS and SPOT data. And they are uh, free of charge and av available uh, for everyone. Uh, but we try to, uh, as you can see that the resolution is not that much uh, fine and the resolution of this sort of product is quite coarse. And uh, in next show, and biodiversity pilots, we try to uh, use the high resolution data and generate this product to be available for all end users. So uh, in this respect, we use a uh, Sentinel-2 image as high resolution data, um, uh, which is available and it was, um, according to our question, I was acceptable by the community of the biodiversity and remote sensing in terms of resolution. Uh, what we have done, we established a community portal. Uh, we have a partner, uh, Tarajwe, that uh, they support and help a lot uh, to, uh, to uh, make everything practical and functional. Uh, through our uh, biodiversity monitoring and ma mapping community portal, we connect with uh, through Tarajwe server and clouds to Sentinel-2 um, data hub. Um, and in the Trojo cloud, we are uh, pre-processing the uh, raw data that that's we got from Sentinel-2. It depends if the user, which type of uh, products they choose on their community portal. If it's necessary, we had to do atmospheric correction and uh, we resampling uh, on uh, 20 meter resolution and then we want the algori uh, algorithm on the cloud. So the products, eventually uh, stored for 48 hours on the ITC University of Toronto server um, to uh, then download by the user. Uh, fortunately, un unfortunately, our server has a limited capacity uh, and the, uh, this was the reason that uh, the final product can be only for 48 hours available on our cloud service. After that, I have to just uh, show the uh, uh, scheme of the community portal. This is the link at the bottom that you can uh, you can check on it and uh, go and uh, uh, retrieve Liferia Index at the global level. The initial aim of this project was uh, only generate Liferia Index at the European level, uh, uh, but uh, we uh, we try to uh, make it at the uh, global uh, level. As you can see, you can uh, determine the starting date and end date and the cloud uh, coverage percentage and determine the area of interest. And eventually you will get the result. This is part of the best uh, part of this image for, uh, is for best part of the Netherlands. Um, as we said, uh, uh, users, uh, if they want directly, can go to our community portal and uh, generate the Liferia index uh, wherever they want at, at the interested date and place that they desire. But also, our products uh, are available at the next year catalog uh, under a biodiversity pilot thematic area for only the Netherlands for uh, years uh, from uh, 2016 to 2019. As an example, that is accessible for the users that they want to use uh, these uh, uh, products for this specific place and date. Also, as Stefan explained a bit uh, and uh, emphasized on that, uh, 
or product delivered to Wahanagan University with the 30 meter resolution uh, as they requested uh, to be added in their model as one of the predictor uh, and help uh, to, to run better uh, their application. And uh, thank you so much. This is uh, what we have done. It was a teamwork from um, a lot of people and different partners. Thank you. Thank you, Elnas. Um, thank you very much. So, um, in interest of time, I think we are now we are going to have a comment from the Geobon um, representative. And that's Nestor Fernandez. He will he he knows about what you have done, both Stefan and you. And uh, we have a comment from him uh, recorded on a video that we will show. He could not be here today, so we that that's why we have a, his video um, message for us. So uh, here we go. I will share this video. It's a couple of minutes long. Hello, my name is Nestor Fernandez. I represent the GeoBond Secretariat. GeoBond is the Geo Group for Biodiversity Observation Networks. And I would like to speak in support of two community portals developed under the Next Geos uh, Biodiversity Pilot. One is the community portal created by IPC at the University of Twente, where users uh, can uh, develop, can produce a uh, leaf area index from Sentinel-2 data at the global level. Leaf area index is an important variable for downstream estimation of essential biodiversity variables, uh, for example, describing ecosystem structure and ecosystem functions. And the second community portal by Wageningen University and Research demonstrates the estimation of one essential biodiversity variable, which is ecosystem extent. By combining in-situ data, and remote sensing data, like for example, the leaf area index through biodiversity models. This portal allows users to generate habitat models for the European habitats throughout Europe. This is important, for example, to estimate changes in uh, habitat extent, in ecosystem extent, in the context of the European Habitat Directive and the assessment of uh, progress towards conservation targets. Those two community portals are relevant for monitoring biodiversity in general and specifically um, some of those products are being mobilized now into the GeoVon uh, EBV portal, the GeoVon portal for the essential biodiversity variables, which is one of the strategic activities of GeoVon for mobilizing data and for promoting the uptake by users of that data. Thank you, Nestor, <laughs> for that uh, message. We will continue with um, Lionel, and uh, he will be invited in. Meanwhile, I think we can uh, introduce, while Lionel is coming in, I think we can introduce our mystery speakers, which is Thierry Rancin and uh, Sergio Albani. Hi, everyone. Hello, Thierry. Hello. Hello, Sergio. And there we have Lionel. So, Lionel, we just jump straight onto your presentations. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. I share my screen, so I know we are time constrained, so I'll try yes. to go fast. Yes. OK, so I'm, I'm Lionel Menard. I'm a research scientist at Center for Observation Impact Energy at Mintaritech. And I'm uh, responsible in NextGeos for the development of the two energy business pilots. So you see those two um, frame, red frame under the two pilots. So energy for rebound solar mapping and energy for grid operation. So the first one, grid operation, is based on an existing service, which currently is called CAMS uh, Radiation Service. It is in operation since, since 2013, and it provides global direct diffuse irradiation as well as direct irradiation on normal plane time series. So currently it is so-called limited, would I say, to access to a single location over the Meteosat second generation 
coverage. Uh, it is um, starting from 2004 to and two days ago, and it is um, it allows you to access uh, this service through graphical user interface, such as the, the display that I'm presenting in the slide, or to automatic machine-to-machine uh, -machine type of requests uh, using WPS. And it is free but limited to 70 requests per day. And the goal of the um, pilot in Exios was basically to enhance the current cancellation service in order to enable access to time series of greeter data. So moving from single point to greeter data, requesting by far much more uh, computer intensive capacity to compute on the fly this process. Uh, the main feature was to allow users to perform selection of area of interest in order for them to gain productivity and to allow sitting and to improve um, accuracy in the measurement. So this nice animation that we will provide basically to capture the ID was to select an area of, of interest over a period of time. So one week at a one hour time frame over France, selected some masks such as the nuts department file and to provide basically the average of the survival edition received on those regions all across the, the week and you see some very uh, informative uh, information for the uh, fraction of PV installed power that may be of interest for grid operation. So this currently uh, pilot is in public release. The second one was a support to a company called Insan Retrust, where we have developed the background information that allow to provide currently online rooftop simulation for the all France, uh, continental France. It's a free tool. You can access the amount of energy uh, uh, that a PV installation will produce on your roof. It performs economic calculation that also include incentive from the government. So there's a lot of Earth observation data set which are in the background, uh, ranging from solar radiation, meteorosat second generation, digital terrain model from SRTM, and digital surface model from hygiene at 10 cent centimeter resolution. So you select a, a, a rooftop, um, and then basically the, the tool provides you with the amount of the PV panel, uh, which are simulated by these little dots from one meter square that you may install and you can vary the amount of PV and have the calculation which is made on the fly. So again, in the second pilot, we want to enhance what is currently existing on this uh, tool in order to provide on the fly time series of global irradiation, which will include the local horizon on a free user selection area of interest. So you have all the data which uh, basically will be used uh, as the, the, for the previous tool, and it will allow basically to perform this free area of interest selection, basically that could uh, allow to prospect new area of interest such as parking lot or industrial wasteland. So it is uh, near to release public, and this animation show you what we have in mind as a final product to allow basically those little one meter square dot uh, to be available for you all over a time um, a time period. So in that case, it's five minutes uh, time span over one day. So. Currently, the, the two pilots will share the same approach in terms of deploying. So we have all the data that has been put on the EGI cloud, and it has been um, uh, allowing access by building WPS, thanks to the TerraDue solution, which allows this web processing to be computed on the fly. We, uh, in the front end, have a Jupyter notebook type of uh, access, which is synchronized on a GitHub. So the main component are GitHub, with all the source available, Jupyter notebook, and Jupyter Hub, which are provided by TerraDue, which as well provide the sandbox and the cloud busting uh, capacity, and all the pilot run on the EGL cloud in production environment. Uh, we have uh, doing three testing phase. Currently, one is ongoing for this week and the week after, and we provide as well end-on session to support basically uh, people to uh, jump into Jupyter Hub, and then we assess user feedback through a series of questionnaires. So now we leave the floor to my colleague Thierry, who will explain what does this uh, uh, tool support the uh, Geovena initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Thierry. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Bente. Uh, I need to wear my glass to, for sharing my screen. Okay, good. So I'm Thierry Ranchin. I'm uh, um, the, the head of uh, the Center for Observation Impact in Energy. I'm a professor at MinParitech and also working as a, a, a scientific coordinator of, uh, of the eShape project. So here 
um, I just come back to uh, some uh, uh, element about uh, GeoVena, which is a geo initiative, one of those um, that was presented by Bente this morning, uh, talking about energy and mineral resource management and focusing on renewable energy. As you see, we have uh, a series of objectives, talking about product, service, support and to end the energy production system. And it's really for user, with user, and provider of Earth observation. And so we are also focusing on policy planning. And uh, what we, is key on what we are doing is uh, this uh, user-oriented initiative with user uptake as a focus. So you have seen the two uh, pilots presented by, uh, by Lionel that are really supporting uh, GeoVena. And uh, you, we are building on uh, the committee portal, which is webserviceenergy.org. And uh, we are working on this uh, uh, next year's project since uh, the very beginning, uh, showing what we can do for that. So if I look to the benefit for uh, for GeoVena about uh, next year, it's the fact that we are working with real case application that's uh, coming from our business uh, user needs. And uh, when we are talking about uh, the transmission system operator, uh, that was the first pilot, uh, it's, it's clear that we are talking about integration about uh, um, renewable energy on, on, the, on the flight and solar energy on the fly. But also we are talking with a network of, of uh, TSO, which is Enstoe, uh, that's also uh, looking to the integration of renewable energy at the European level. So this means that there is an impact uh, for uh, at uh, from the point of view of the policy planning on the, uh, about the work done uh, within next years, you see also this uh, example uh, uh, for this company in San uh, showing the benefits uh, for PV services for citizens. So this means that we are also tackling startup level or a small and medium enterprise and the citizen because through this. Uh, this type of service that will be able to uh, have uh, access to uh, to information that allow them to uh, to propose to 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 install some PV system on on their roof. So that's uh, all the, the the ticks that are here are the what we have uh, uh, linked uh, between uh, GeoVener and uh, what has been done during. Uh, uh, next year. So that's really EO products and services for energy management. It's really supporting end to end energy production, starting from TSO and going to the citizen. It was co designed between user and provider of Earth observation. And that's really, uh, on, on full our focus of, uh, use, uh, this, uh, this element to help policy planning. And that's user oriented and user uptake. Uh, as a focus, really, and that's really the uh, the main objective of of Geovena. So, uh, in addition to this, we have learned a lot during uh, this experience about uh, cloud-based services, about the tool for uh, development and the scalability. All all of these elements have been uh, uh, proposed and uh, and discussed uh, the last day, and will be also on on the on the follow-up of of the discussion. So. Let's go now to eShape. eShape is a Eurojo uh, showcase application powered by Europe. And uh, it's really uh, try to uh, strengthen the benefits for Europe of GEOS and, uh, and vice versa. So that's a, a strong support for the European Commission uh, to Eurojo regional GEO. And uh, we, we are really pushing on, on, on the vision to develop operational services with and for the users. And the idea is to have a, a, a hand to hand um, um, area where we can, environment, sorry, where we can conduct, uh, start with uh, the legacy of the previous projects. And so looking to the research project, what can be uh, in the future an operational, uh, an operational services and to try to strengthen all the elements that can be done in this, uh, in this uh, aim in order to have at the end of the day um, new services, uh, sustainable development, user uptake and uh, also um, new services for the community. So eShape is more than a, a project. It's also a support to uh, Eurogeo uh, regional activity um, uh, which was defined 
uh, in order to shift from the data-centric approach to a user-centric approach, and those that's key in, in our uh, in our work. And uh, through Eurojo, we are contributing to uh, Geo and all the uh, uh, the goals, the system level development goal, the Paris Agreement, and also the Sendai framework, and even more because we are also contributing to uh, some strong UN uh, activity. So some fast facts, you have uh, the, the seven uh, um, showcase that are here. Uh, agriculture, health, renewable energy, ecosystem, water, and disaster, and climate. Uh, you saw that we developed 27 pilots. Uh, it's 55 partners and it's a four-year grant. And uh, you hear, if you are here since uh, the very beginning of the week, so much example where eShape was mentioned that you can easily understand that uh, eShape will uh, uh, use uh, NextGeo uh, within uh, uh, these different pilot. And uh, even yesterday, uh, Lionel uh, presents the details of about the legacy we will have from NextGeo and the, the number of pilots that are going to use it. So when I'm looking to the benefit for eShape, so that was uh, a curve of, uh, of learning and uh, NextGeo is serving the business need, which is also aiming uh, in, in eShape, is one of the solutions for the pilot implementation. And we have a lot of, uh, of our pilots that are proposing to use it. Uh, and even the new onboarded one uh, that uh, has been proposed uh, so we have 34 uh, applications to our onboarding uh, um, process, and uh, most of, some of them have proposed uh, uh, to use NextGeos. Lionel also presented yesterday the, uh, these uh, numbers. And uh, uh, NextGeos is also an associate partner of eShape. So this means that there will be, in the a, in a near future, links uh, between eShape and, and NextGeos and NextEOS even uh, to continue the collaboration. So the, the follow-up will be uh, the extension of the service, of the service uh, based on the scalability of the next year's approach. Uh, in our KPA, we have to also go toward the DIAS, not only uh, about Wikio, but all of them. Uh, and uh, Wikio will be uh, our focus in the energy uh, and in Geovina. So uh, there is a support on cloud integration and, uh, and there is this uh, burst uh, process that will be of interest. We have set up a co-design activity, which is a bit different on, on the one of Next Geos, but which is key also on what we are doing. And the uh, Next uh, Geos and Next EOS is also involved in that. Uh, we are looking to the user uptake and sustainability of the pilots within eShape. And some of them that are a legacy from Next Geo are part of uh, eShape. And we are looking to the market penetration in eShape, supporting also uh, EuroGeo and Geo. And so to conclude, uh, I have the feeling that NextGeo is serving uh, the business community for decision maker to citizen. And we have some very nice example uh, in, in the different pilot presented uh, during uh, this summit. Uh, uh, NextGeo is really serving the Geo Vena community and objective view. You saw that uh, we checked all the, the different objective of, of Geo Vena. Uh, with a pilot uh, developed within NextGeos and the architecture and all the, the tools that have been developed. And that was also a precursor of some of the activity within eShape. And of course, it will be uh, a support in its new form to uh, to, to EuroGeo. And uh, that's uh, one, uh, let's say, remark and uh, some, uh, some food uh, for home. Uh, to work on on that on the the clarification uh, of uh, of the position of next year, uh, um towards the DAS and to see that uh, there is no uh, competition in between so and from what i hear on on the different presentation it is not really competing so thanks a lot for your for hearing my presentation and then i give the floor back thank you thank you theory very much for that we hurry on because now we are only 12.32. Thank you for those who are still here. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, Sergio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bente. I promise I'll try to be uh, as short as possible, as brief as possible. So um, 
First of all, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Sergio Albani. I'm the head of the research, technology development, uh, and uh, innovation unit uh, at the European Union Satellite Center. And uh, um, I would like to talk about uh, the role of Satsun within NextGeos, uh, as well as uh, the uh, link between NextGeos uh, and the space and security community activity, also led by Satsun. So basically, I, I will cover two roles at the same time. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see it. Yeah. Launch also the presentation. Here you are. So let's start with uh, a very brief introduction of the Satsun role in, uh, in uh, GEO. As you may know, uh, the European Union Satellite Center uh, is an agency of the Council of the European Union. We are located in the vicinity of uh, Madrid in uh, Spain. Uh, we are uh, primary users uh, of uh, Earth observation data and we are providing services uh, uh, related to the uh, geospatial intelligence uh, domain. Um, let me uh, clarify a bit uh, what's the role of Satsen within, within GEO. We are participating in GEO through different axes of actuation. Uh, the, first one, the first one is that we are a GEO participating organization. Uh, so we are, of course, endorsing uh, uh, the, the GEO uh, strategic plan for the, for the coming years. We are members uh, of the European GEO High Level Working Group, and we are also participating in the EuroGEO Coordination Group, including uh, those activities uh, uh, related to the EuroGEO Action Group for Disaster Resilience. Um, we are contributing to a number of Horizon 2020 projects uh, linked to GEO objectives, uh, namely uh, NECGEOS and uh, eShape. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, we are leading the space and security community activity. The aim of this, uh, of this community activity is to develop uh, uh, capabilities and solutions uh, to support the well-being and security of countries and citizens by exploiting suitable space assets and collateral data. I will go a bit more in detail uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the space and security community activity in the coming slides. But before, let me talk to you about uh, what we uh, did uh, within the space and security innovation pilot in uh, NextGeos. So um, the context of the pilot, as you can imagine, the uh, security stakeholders that need to monitor uh, areas during large periods of time uh, can rely on Earth observation data. And uh, um, as you can imagine, this is a quite time consuming task, but the work efficiency can be dramatically improved by highlighting relevant changes over the areas of interest under uh, monitoring. So um, the goal of the, uh, of the pilot we implemented within the GEOS was to uh, discover access and exploit Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data to generate the change detection uh, maps, thus benefiting from the, from the uh, free, full and open policy of, this, uh, of, of the Copernicus program. The, the, the main aim was then to process uh, this data to automatically detect the changes uh, occurring at different temporal and spatial uh, scales. And uh, um, this uh, also building a collaborative environment, uh, enabling us to share results with the relevant uh, stakeholders and partners. The specific challenges uh, we dealt with were to develop cloud native applications uh, to process Earth observation data and uh, again to share uh, Earth observation data sets uh, in a similar way with the stakeholders in the space and security uh, domain. Some details uh, more on uh, what we uh, practically did uh, with uh, uh, NextGeos. First, uh, we developed the two Earth observation applications uh, to automatically detect changes in pairs of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 images. You can see a couple of examples uh, uh, here with Sentinel-1, we detected some, some patterns uh, of migration in, in desertic areas. Uh, while with Sentinel-2, you can see uh, here is an example uh, um, in the Charpia Island uh, in Bangladesh where uh, Rohingya refugees uh, have been uh, reallocated by, by Bangladesh authorities. As you can see here, the construction of 
uh, of a, uh, a refugee camp and all the uh, work to protect these refugees from, from the floodings that are uh, affecting the island. Um, then the second point was to successfully deploy these applications in cloud environment. And here you can see uh, an example of what we did using the, the uh, NextGeos uh, capabilities. And the, the third point was to catalog these results uh, using the NextGeos uh, uh, data hub. Uh, that was uh, done to allow, of course, the sharing of results with the relevant stakeholders and to facilitate cooperation. You can see here uh, some example of, uh, of data sets that we put within NextGeos, uh, not only the ones generated within the geos uh, but also internal ones uh, and other data sets that we uh, generated in the framework of, of other horizon 2020 projects uh, for instance uh, uh, better okay so that's was uh, uh, that was we uh, did um, within NextGeos, uh, let me now move to the space and security community activity. So I would like to spend some word on what is this, uh, this activity and how this job uh, that we did in NextGeos uh, is, is benefiting, uh, is benefiting this, uh, this activity. So um, the space and security community activity is composed by uh, a number of partners, uh, the European Space Agency, the Work Food Program, uh, the uh, Institute for Water Education of UNESCO, Eurogeo Survey, and the uh, Federal Agency of Germany for uh, uh, Geography and, and uh, uh, Cartography and Geodesy. Um, what we want to do within the, uh, this community activity, we want to announce the resilience of the society against the natural and man-made disasters, to uh, enhance the protection of critical infrastructure, um, enhance the efficiency in a number of tasks related to border and maritime surveillance, uh, as well as to civil protection and uh, humanitarian aid. And last but not least, uh, to enhance the capacity of relevant stakeholders uh, to achieve those sustainable development goals uh, uh, relevant for, for the security domain. Uh, what we are going to do in the coming years uh, is to implement a collaborative pilot uh, with all these uh, uh, partners uh, in line with their uh, needs and, and uh, synergies. So um, let me now try to see, uh, to, to, to show you the link between NextGeos and the space and security community uh, activity. Um, NextGeos uh, provides the infrastructure to deploy earth observation applications and the means to catalog data sets generated by different uh, users. So uh, it's enabling to, to share know-how and, uh, and results. Um, a number of products uh, have been already inserted by Satsen in the NextGeos Data Hub, I already presented it to you, uh, and the aim was to engage uh, new users uh, and, to, uh, and new stakeholders in the space and security domain. So uh, we are benefiting of, of this important uh, capability of, of NextGeos to enlarge the user community. Uh, the second point, uh, building of the, on, the, on the NextGeos experience, uh, we developed uh, in uh, in Satsen uh, a platform called uh, called uh, Jodam, Geospatial Data Management Platform, and this platform is conceived to generate and sustain research and innovation results from a number of uh, initiatives, uh, including uh, the ones of of uh, NextGeos. This uh, uh, platform is uh, empowering the collaboration between uh, within the, the members uh, of, uh, of the geospace and security activity and more in general within the, the stakeholders uh, of, uh, of Satsen. Uh, just to give an example, Jodamp was used to prepare the, the, the civil security pilot uh, that I presented to you, the one on Charpia, and we showcased this uh, uh, pilot within the Eurogeo uh, session uh, that was uh, uh, presented in the a week held in, uh, in Canberra uh, last year. Then, okay, let's mention, let's mention uh, e shape. Um, the upscale of uh, the Satsen NextGeos applications uh, to a TRL 8, 9 would make available to us a key operational earth observation service uh, of benefit for uh, European users uh, and decision makers. So we are currently looking on how uh, to, to implement these and uh, and we are of course looking at the e shape onboarding process as uh, as we believe that the uh, e shape would be the perfect framework to support uh, uh, to support this activity let me conclude with uh, a bit more on, on, on future future activities next tios so here 
I, I believe that uh, the liaison with the next EOS will facilitate the uptake of new ideas that are currently, uh, how can I say, flourishing uh, within the space and security community activity. And uh, also the identification of synergies with other geo uh, initiatives. Now, I guess that it should be more or less clear how we want to, to contribute to, to Eurogeo and to GEO, so leveraging on this uh, uh, cross-fertilized environment in which these uh, new application uh, results uh, can be, can be uh, developed and, uh, and announced. I hope it was uh, clear. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for the attention. Uh, if you have questions, you can uh, put it in the, in the chat or just drop me a line on this uh, email uh, address. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Sergio. And indeed, you can ask questions in the chat. And I will record that. And when we have a discussion in the afternoon where we will discuss both this morning and the afternoon discussion. OK, uh, questions. So the next on my list is Brian. And as you know, we are over time. So Brian, um, short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Brian McAllister. I work as the systems development lead at the South African Environmental Observation Network here in South Africa. Let me just share my presentation now. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about is just uh, the sharing of data between Seon and NextGeos and how this can potentially be viewed as an exemplar or, or a good example of working towards uh, the link up to, of regional geos and, and in particular with AfriGeo um, on which we are a contributing member in South Africa. Um, so just first a little bit of background about Seon. So Seon is, is basically a government funded research organization in South Africa funded by our Department of Science and Innovation. Um, we are primarily in, involved in the long-term observation of the environment in South Africa, uh, primarily employing earth observations uh, technologies, uh, primarily or predominantly uh, the use of in situ observations. Uh, this gets done across the major biological biomes of, of, of South Africa, um, including our oceans and coasts, as well as, uh, for example, our Feinbos areas in the Cape, grasslands, forests, wetlands, etc., and arid areas, and even into the Kruger National Park. Um, so Sound is divided up into different business units or nodes um, where that observ observation gets done by uh, specialized environmental scientists in those areas. Um, there is also a business unit involved with respect to information and data management, which makes sure that all of that data becomes open and is shared using uh, information systems that employ uh, open standards and so on. Um, we have several projects uh, that we employ as well, which are uh, government funded, um, including the South African Risk and Vulnerability Atlas, where we look at vulnerability from both the social side and also environmental side of things. Also by Energy Atlas, where we look at the uh, use and production of bioenergy in South Africa and also the marine information management system where we have data on our oceans and coasts produced by uh, you know predominantly cruise type of data um, and other types of observations and then lastly the carbon sinks atlas uh, which looks at the storage of carbon in our environment so that's in brief the, the projects that we've worked on our engagement with next geos has been the sharing of a collection uh, within the, uh, the wide set of data that we have. That represents roughly 467 data sets uh, produced by the Climate Systems Analysis Group uh, at the University of Cape Town. And it pr predominantly represents model-based outputs or projections of both temperature and rainfall in the current, near term, and also future term. Um, and this data has been successfully shared with NextGeos um, and uh, as mentioned, it represents for now one collection that we've been able to share and hopefully there will be many more to come. Um, 
So as mentioned, this collection has been shared with NextGeos and is now discoverable via the NextGeos uh, uh, portal, as can be shown. And then just to end off on generally the way forward for us here, we are very much interested in continuing to share additional collections from Sayon in South Africa, as well as from the other institutes in South Africa. Um, and you know, knowing, noting that this can really serve as an exemplar to the other members of AfriGeo on the African continent. We will definitely also communicate this in our engagements with AfriGeo. Uh, and Sam in general also aims to, to contribute voluntarily to AfriGeo as well as to NextGeos um, and really having this as a demonstrator of what is possible. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, just one quick question. Um, what, would you say it was uh, time consuming to make this connection or uh, was it hard to do this work or was it easier or something in between? Um, it, it was mostly a technical endeavor. We were benefiting from the fact that we already have an open data catalog on our side of things that had been curated and had, had systems available. Mm -hmm. So just mainly the, the, the point of putting up a, a, a a data, a metadata harvest endpoint uh, in its standards compliant fashion um, and working with the technical guys at NextGeos to achieve that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Guido, last but absolutely not least, Guido. Hello. <laughs> thank uh, you for uh, your patience. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm Guido Colangeli supporting the European Space Agency in the geo geo geos um, endeavor and in particular in the technical coordination so uh i'm going to share my entire screen or yes yes but, uh, yeah we can share that and chrome is not responding saying can you could you hear me we can hear you and we can see you. Okay, this is okay, but uh, it's, it's hanging around the Google Chrome is not responding, saying so. Okay. We'll take a second, otherwise uh, I think you can take over uh, with a slide and uh, I'll tell you maybe to- Yes, to, yes. Uh, through the slides maybe, huh? Um, Marie-Francoise, everything, ready to Everything share. is going to be grayed out, I think. Still. Yes, I can uh, share it from here if you want. Yes, please. Um, so I'm here. Uh, so still, I cannot see the the slides because the Google uh, apparently hang hang is hanging. Yeah, you. But we can see you, and you are connected here. Okay. So. Uh, okay. Very good. So I'm running uh, also the slides on my side on another browser or another tab of the browser. Yeah. So, I am, um, I am just sharing briefly, sorry about this glitch, but uh, I am sharing your slides here, uh, Guido, if you want. So I'm I'm here to, uh, in fact, uh, uh, on behalf of the whole Geos platform team. So it's not just myself, but uh, everybody that contributed to this uh, um, to this endeavor. Um, um, so I'm opening up the as well my my slides. And so we can, uh, you can go to the next slide, uh, uh, please. And uh, it's done. Very, very slow. Uh, you, you can start. So are you now to the slide two? Uh, yes. Marie Francoise? Okay, thank you. Um, so, yes. Um, we all know the GEOS vision, and, uh, but I would like just to uh, go through the user centrality that is means to engage the user communities to better understand their needs, deliver solutions and advocate the benefits. So next slide is uh, who did we involve in fact? Uh, so we involved a number of flagship initiatives and community activities within GEO and we served the uh, three main focus area, the sustainable development goals, disaster risk reduction, climate change. We have a number of regional GEO and especially H2020 projects. So we served uh, 
we, we created a number of scenarios uh, that can be also uh, browsed through a presentation. I will show you just a link uh, later on with more than 100 requirements. So next slide is, uh, um, uh, be a step, uh, I'll tell you when you have to uh, uh, enter, uh, when you click on the enter, May Francoise, merci. Um, so that's uh, the, 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 the results of that was uh, an evolved GEOS platform, uh, the oper uh, an operational one that is running in uh, under geoporta.org, but also a series of proof of concepts for the uh, this evolution of GEOS at large. Next, enter. And, and so um, uh, G the GEOS platform is, uh, uh, and also all, give another enter, to see all the platform components. The portal that is a little bit the, the component of the platform prov providing the front end to, uh, to all those uh, geos resources. The discovery and access broker that is the, the middle layer um, handling all the uh, protocols and the connection with the, with the different catalogs. The yellow pages to register the organization. The status checker from FGDC, so University of Geneva is the uh, handled by the handles the uh, yellow pages while well, this is checking from our american colleagues uh, from uh, fgdc and that provides some check health checking for for the provided service so next uh, slide is showing also the possibility to uh, reuse things from the platform so we have api mirrors widgets and views that are uh, if you are keen you can see uh, um, see the, 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 this, uh, these instruments, how can the, and the capabilities they can offer to and next uh, enter enter again uh, uh, the, 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 the message, the, 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 the possibility from the platform to enable application to developers to export, to, to customize uh, these, those capabilities on at, at their premises. And we'll see an example with NextGIS uh, in a second. So next uh, is, uh, so the operational just platform, we, we know that we have an operational one and a proof of concept. The operational one has a really a, a unique uh, uh, a plethora of uh, uh, data sets and data, particularly data that have been, uh, uh, we are connected through. So next, enter, enter uh, the message. In fact, uh, I think the uh, really the, um, the, the, uh, peculiarity of the platform is the heterogeneity. If I can say one word on that is the, the possibility to navigate through data provided by different organizations and really with external heterogeneous infrastructure. And this is uh, performed not having a, a single byte of data, but just connecting to the provided uh, data. Next slide is also showing the proof of concept. So we can experiment uh, on that proof of concept uh, access, uh, uh, simultaneous access to data, information, and services, but also we um, we tried uh, the public cloud-based uh, platforms and uh, uh, we ran as well um, uh, models of, of, of the enter, and uh, uh, we can see just uh, an example. We, did, we will not see here, but I would like just to point it out the uh, SDG 15.3.1 indicator, that is the proportional land that is degraded over total land area, that in collaboration with the Geo Essential has been um, fundamental to, or, to carry on this, this particular peculiar proof of concept. So enter again, and this is the scenario to run uh, the model. Uh, this is, uh, so you, you will have, so in this case, I introduce also the, the scenario that is a pretty presentation that you can run through. Uh, the link is at the end of this presentation and see that we have a model. We have um, a number of, uh, um, a number of um, um, uh, clouds where you can run the model and uh, uh, scientific articles that, uh, uh, that show that uh, th those models and uh, uh, and that the queue actually you can run from the platform, so from the portal, and those are the links. Uh, the links. So enter again. So again, uh, the uh, the different. Uh, I would say the three are the main uh, messages: heterogeneity, consumability, heterogeneity in the sense 
of the data that we said before, but also to simultaneously browse, browse data, information services, and uh, run uh, uh, models on that. And so to facilitate the knowledge in doing that, and, but also uh, we try to promote models and so the, uh, the algorithms and so uh, the scientific outreach. All of this has entered again, and all of this uh, have been presented to the GEOS infrastructure development task team for further evolution of the infrastructure, because, because again, this is a proof of concept. Next slide, uh, we'll see uh, really the interaction that we had with the next GEOS team. And so within the proof of concept, we tried uh, uh, an experiment uh, some data discovery and access and use through a direct connection with the next GEOS catalog. So it's a loosely integrating, um, inter integrated uh, thing. And also, on the other side, we connected the platform and next GEOS through the uh, GEOS widget. Next slide is showing really this concept. So from the portal, you can access uh, through the, uh, um, the next GEOS catalog like that as a selector in the, in the, the bottom. Maybe you can see the, uh, the bottom of the, uh, where is this written next GEOS. So, the, uh, so there is a selector to connect with it, those uh, uh, Catalogs. You, then you can uh, enter again, and you have also the other there and enter again. Um, you have also the other the other side. So from the next Geos uh, community portal, we have a way to connect to through the Geos widget. So with the uh, API and the same look and feel of the uh, Geos portal uh, to connect with the um, Geos platform and the Geos uh, catalog. So if you click enter, then you have as well the link to the Geos portal proof of concept and the link to the next Geos. And, and it's very unfortunate that they cannot show that because I was going to run this uh, uh, this demo online, but unfortunately I can't. So you can uh, enter again, but you can do by yourself. So for example, you can search for COVID um, on uh, both on the next Geos and the uh, the catalog and uh, the juice the plot and the juice portal and see that the results are the same because of this connection but also um, uh, you can uh, from the geos search widget that is plugged uh, within the next geos uh, portal you can have access to the uh, recall the geos search uh, uh, widget and uh, uh, do your your search there with the same and you have the results and the same look and feel of the geos so the next slide, that is the links side. Uh, the, the, the links slide, you see that uh, we have the link to the operational Geos platform, but also um, a, a link to the uh, presentation and the various demonstration of the scenarios from the proof of concept uh, directly with a link or just going through the geopolitical.org and uh, by Diane Burger map. Uh, we have different perspectives of this scenario, running this uh, scenario. So you have YouTube short clips uh, to see. So please have a look to the, that uh, uh, documentation as well. Uh, that is available at that link on the um, GeoSec, uh, um, GeoSec Secretary uh, website. So this is uh, and my my, de my demonstration, unfortunately. And thank you so much, Marie Francoise, for that. I haven't a rooster, next just rooster, but I can do a live one. Next deals. Thank you so much. Back to you. <laughs> thank you so much for that entertainment <laughs> outing. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, that was really wonderful. Um, I, I just want to use the opportunity to correct myself, by the way, because when I was presenting, I was saying that we had a widget on on um, on Geo's portal. In fact, we are we are connect we are not loosely connected, uh, Guido. We have an open search API uh, connection, so that's yeah, yeah. more specifically. Yeah, what yeah, we absolutely. Are. If I yeah. can say something, is just uh, uh, loosely in the sense that. Uh, is in the proof of concept is the the connection is quite uh, clear and easy uh, and I, I anticipate your next question to me is was very very easy to connect with but the thing is that we need uh, uh, a wide discussion on the architecture because we need to uh, open up or just evolve the architecture and, uh, and so for that the G uh, GDITT will be the, the, the a great place to open up the discussion and see how we can evolve like right that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I, I, 
done already with the ITTT. I have set the question and uh, they should uh, define a process to um, decide which uh, capacity is deployed in operation. Absolutely. So I have uh, not any more any control, unfortunately, because it's still uh, everything is grayed out. Uh, so just uh, cut my camera and uh, <laughs> a micro whenever you like. Thank you so much. We see you very clearly, uh, Guido. Thank you so much for for staying on, and thank you indeed for a very good presentation, a lovely overview of the Geos portal. And I'm sure we will continue to collaborate. I think we have demonstrated that uh, the great progress has been made in terms of making a system of systems. So um, with that, I think we really need some food. Uh, Marie Françoise, do you have something you want to say now before we uh, go to the next uh, session in one hour? You're muted. We have seen a lot of examples of uh, typical Nexgeos pilots, uh, which are pilots uh, building over Copernicus and uh, requiring a lot of uh, calculation capacities, such as uh, the essential variables are a really good example of that. And these are the typical uh, pilots of Nexgeos. Of course, Nexgeos can make more simple pilots, uh, just accessing data, and I think that uh, this is no problem. We have seen uh, uh, some attempts to connect to uh, Scion and other international initiatives. Uh, we have also worked with um, with uh, Amerigio, uh, USGS, and um, and uh, thank you, uh, Guido, to have uh, explained because this is complex integration to explain in which direction, which direction you can integrate and how and and uh, uh, with a widget or as a data source or as other capacities. Uh, we are in a complex environment, so communicating is not easy, and I think uh, we have to uh, repeat it uh, regularly to make it clear to all. And, and we are connected uh, with um, so many, so many uh, geo initiatives. Thank you. Are you unmuted, Benta? Thank, thank you. I thought just I was just commenting on um, on the chat here and uh, thank you for your engagement and uh, indeed uh, I, I'm happy that we uh, collectively have some food for thoughts now and uh, we will see you in the afternoon and that's when we can also invite you more as speaker we have only a few speakers then not like this morning which is crazy in number of speakers uh, the afternoon it, it will be much easier to raise your hand and come into the room. We will be able to invite you also directly used. And Jill, if you are still here, uh, so the people from the commission, absolutely welcome. Okay, food for the stomach now. <laughs> See you in an hour. Bye-bye. <laughs>